that. Uh, good evening, uh, everybody. Um, welcome to uh, Gladys Van Harland House for this evening's lecture by Emma D'Souza. My name is Kevin Kenny. I'm uh, director of Gladys Van Harland House, the Centre for the Study of Ireland and the Irish Diaspora here at NYU. Uh, we hold public events here in uh, Ireland House every Thursday evening. Um, by the quirk of uh, this year's calendar, uh, combined with uh, some excellent planning by our staff, this has really been a bumper month. Um, I've uh, rec recognised quite a few faces who have been uh, with us for every uh, event. Uh, February this year began on a Thursday, uh, the first day of the month, and it ends in a leap year today on February 29th. Uh, that means we hosted uh, not four, but five uh, big events in this room, and many of you have been at uh, all of them, uh, including last week uh, the 25th anniversary uh, Ernie O'Malley lecture when we launched Annalisa Shroud's extraordinary book on humanitarian giving, the origins of humanitarian giving in the Great Irish Famine. Uh, the latest volume in the acclaimed uh, Gladstone Irish Diaspora series. A uh, week before that, we launched Paul Lynch's Booker Prize winning novel, uh, Prophet Song. Uh, mark your calendars for next week uh, when Ireland's former ambassador to the United States, public intellectual Dan Mulhall, um, will launch Pilgrim Soul, uh, his new book on uh, WB8. So, uh, delighted to see. Um, so many uh, familiar faces and old friends, and to welcome Loretta Brennan Glaxman, uh, who's uh, <laughs> the, the founder and the chair of our advisory board, T uh, Ted Smith, the president. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and uh, from the National Committee on Foreign Policy, Susan Elliott and uh, Aaron O'Donnell. Mm -hmm. uh, Welcome, everybody. Uh, Northern Ireland, uh, its history, politics, uh, culture, and fragile peace um, has long been central uh, to, uh, to the mission of Drexel and Ireland House. And we're therefore especially pleased uh, to welcome Emma D'Souza to deliver her uh, public lecture, uh, Turn of the Tide, the Future of Northern Ireland's Peace Process. A couple of little housekeeping items. Um, please turn off your cell phones. I think I just did mine. I hope I did. Um, uh, the session is being recorded, and uh, Emma has um, agreed to speak for maybe just 25 minutes, actually, because uh, she understands what we know in Ireland House is that we want to have a conversation. Uh, we really want to, to draw the audience in. I must say, I'm thrilled to see that Emma isn't using slides either, <laughs> yes. uh, because there is power in the spoken word, <laughs> and uh, we, we'll hear that uh, part this evening. Uh, during the Q&A, uh, bearing in mind that the session is recorded, uh, we will have handheld mics uh, passed uh, through both rooms. And please use the mic uh, so other people can hear you, and so we can pick it up on the, on the audio feed as well. Emma D'Souza is a journalist, a campaigner, and peace builder. She's the founder and co-facilitator of Northern Ireland Civic Initiative, director of the Emerging Leaders Program with the National Committee on American Foreign Policy. I'm proud to say I'm a mentor uh, in that program. Uh, thank, thank you, you Susan and Aaron. Um, and a Northern Ireland advisor on uh, peace processes and policy. In 2020, Emma successfully delivered substantial changes to UK immigration law after a five-year court case uh, to bring legislation in line with UK commitments to the Belfast uh, Good Friday Agreement. The case uh, has been referred to as the first human rights case of the agreement and resulted in changes that reaffirmed the identity and citizenship provisions by delivering EU family reunion rights uh, to people in Northern Ireland. Following this, Emma established the first All-Ireland uh, Women's Forum within the National Women's Council of Ireland, a new peace-building structure 
that brings women from across the island of Ireland together to work collectively in addressing women, peace and security issues. Emma served as chair and facilitator of that forum from 21 to 23 and continues as a member. Uh, last year she founded the Civic Initiative, a new participatory structure that brings together a wide range of civic society organisations to create a space for deliberative dialogues on advancing and supporting peace, reconciliation and well-being. Emma is an accomplished journalist, uh, writing for the Irish Times, the Irish Examiner, The Guardian, Open Democracy, Byline Times, and many other uh, publications. And for the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement last year, she hosted a six-part uh, podcast on Northern Ireland's peace process, um, listen to the title, uh, Lost in Implementation. <laughs> Lost in Implementation. Um, a quote uh, from Emma's uh, brief summary of, the, of tonight's presentation as we were planning it. Um, Each generation presents an opportunity for change. And in the context of Northern Ireland, a new generation, unencumbered by the divisions of the past, has been born. As Ireland, North and South, grapples with the political and societal impacts of Brexit, the so-called peace generation is carving out a new path. Welcome, Emma. Thank you, Kevin, uh, for that kind introduction and um, very generously reading out a very long bio there. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you all this evening and thank you um, Ted, Kevin, Loretta for hosting me uh, tonight. Um, I'm going to give you a brief overview of the current context in Northern Ireland and I'm going to do it in three stages. I'm going to talk a little bit about the present, so the changes that have happened. I'm then going to talk about some of the challenges and I promise you, even though that second section is a little bleak, a little depressing, the third segment where I talk about the future and the positives and the hopes, I promise that part is longer. So, to start, today more people in Northern Ireland identify as neither unionist nor nationalist. And that matters because the conflict in Northern Ireland was rooted in identity and political sectarianism. In place of divisive murals rooted in the past, we now have globally recognized street art that shows social justice issues such as mental health and gender equality. Areas such as East Belfast that would have once been a unionist stronghold now have GAA clubs and Irish language schools. Over 600,000 people have been born in Northern Ireland since 1998, and this is a wholly different generation living their lives in different times, and building a new and progressive society, or at least trying to. Politically, after a two-year collapse, Northern Ireland's devolved institutions have been restored, with the first nationalist first minister, as well as a nationalist opposition leader in the form of the Social Democrats and Labour Party's Matthew O'Toole. For the first time in the history of Northern Ireland, pro-United Ireland parties hold both the office of First Minister and the role of opposition. Political unionism, by contrast, is in decline in Northern Ireland, having lost majorities at Westminster, the Assembly, local government, and most recently, the office of First Minister. To some of the challenges. The peace process in Northern Ireland, in my view, is largely stagnant. There have been eight subsequent agreements since the signing of the Good Friday Agreement and not one of them has been fully implemented. The Good Friday Agreement is lauded as one of the most successful peace agreements of the last century, and in many ways it is, because we have a sustained period of an end of violence. But the vast majority of its mechanisms and commitments to build social cohesion, improve equality, and deliver an economic peace dividend have never been fully realized. Social housing remains 90% segregated, Education remains 93% segregated, and over 100 peace walls still remain standing, the latter literally <coughs> physically dividing societies. Lasting effects resulting from a failure to deliver on the socio-economic commitments within the agreement 
continue to be felt by Northern Ireland's youth, leading a disproportionately high volume of young people to leave Northern Ireland in the so-called brain drain. A 2021 survey from Think Tank Pivotal indicated that the majority of those who leave opt not to return. Respondents cited per community relations as a key motivator, adding that political divisions were a significant push factor. Young people are often the drivers of change, but in the context of Northern Ireland, there has not been enough done to equip the next generation of peace builders and political leaders with the resources and skills necessary to better take forward the peace process. The Good Friday Agreement does not form a core part of the curriculum in Northern Ireland, and many young people leave the education system with little to no knowledge of the agreement or Northern Ireland's conflict. A lack of future proofing and succession planning has led to an aging society of peace builders, with the majority of Northern Ireland peace workers at or entering retirement age. When it comes to the peace process, there is often a tendency to look backwards. Young people are not only deprived of the opportunity to understand our history, but are segregated from the age of five. This division is reported to cost an annual cost of 226 million extra a year. Outside of education, Northern Ireland has the worst health times in the UK, a reality which has devastating consequences, with a 2022 report indicating that over 17,000 people died before receiving treatment over a three-year period. Despite an innate desire for reconciliation among the population, sectarianism remains institutionalized across education, housing, policing, and employment. The Good Friday Agreement included several commitments to challenge the sectarian structures that Northern Ireland was built upon, including the right to freedom from sectarian harassment, the right to freely choose one's place of residence, and the right to freedom and expression of religion. And yet, nearly a quarter of a century on, children continue to be born, raised, and reared under the same structures as their parents and grandparents. Such is the level of failure to tackle sectarianism in all of its forms that we have yet to define sectarianism as a standalone hate crime aggravator. At present, there is no legal definition of sectarianism in Northern Ireland. Current incitement to hatred legislation does cover forms of sectarian incitement, but does not use the word. Instead, using other markers, such as nationality, religion, and other indicators of ethnicity. The aggravated sentences hate crimes legislation also omits the term sectarian, and applies a narrow definition of religious belief as the protected ground. This ad hoc approach to addressing sectarianism allows it to fall outside the scope of anti-discrimination and human rights standards. It, in its most recent report on the UK compliance with treaty-based obligations on minority rights, the Council of Europe once again called for sectarianism to be defined in legislation. Conflict has largely ended in Northern Ireland, but violence still remains. Whilst open conflict in the streets is no longer a fixture of life, the same cannot be said for society at large behind closed doors, with women and girls experiencing shocking levels of violence and abuse. Research from Ulster University suggests 98% of women in Northern Ireland have experienced at least one form of violence or abuse in their lifetime, with 50% enduring maltreatment before the age of 11 and 7 out of 10 <coughs> experiencing some form of violence or abuse within the last 12 months. Women are at risk of higher levels of gender-based violence during times of conflict and in post-conflict societies. Yet women are only mentioned twice in the Good Friday Agreement, with no reference to gender-based violence or the lived experiences of women in conflict. Today, Northern Ireland is statistically one of the most dangerous places in Europe for women, with femicide levels outranked only by Romania. The safety of women goes hand in hand with democracy. When women are safe, society flourishes. Another factor within the Northern Irish context is the threat posed by paramilitary organizations. And it does 
depressed me a little to be talking about paramilitaries over 25 years after the peace agreement. Instead of being free of paramilitaries in Northern Irish societies, some of the most deprived areas are still under the grip of these organizations. And instead of addressing that, we watch TV ads akin to safe driving ads telling us about coercive control and the risk of paramilitaries. In many ways, their existence has become normalized. As highlighted in Sustainable Development Goal 5, Gender equality is not only a fundamental human right, but a necessary foundation for a peaceful, prosperous, and sustainable world. Despite the good news about a return to power sharing, and it is good news, don't get me wrong, and I promise you, I'm going to get to some good positive stuff soon. <laughs> the Northern Ireland um, political structures are not stable. The institutions established under the Good Friday Agreement were designed to force two opposing political factions to share power for the betterment of society. It was revolutionary for the time, but the mechanisms that were intended to foster greater cooperation were soon manipulated and distorted into vehicles for self-serving vetoes, and should any one party step off the pitch, ball goes with them. There have been seven collapses of Northern Ireland's executive in its 25-year history totaling over a decade without a functioning, devolved government. Imagine for a moment if there was no Senate, or if the House of Representatives didn't sit for years on end and politicians continue to get paid, while services crumbled. I don't think it would be tolerated too much here in the US, or in the UK, or many other places, or maybe I'm wrong, I'm getting, I'm getting some people <laughs> laughing here, but in Northern Ireland, it is, it's normal. There are young people growing up today that don't know what a functioning government looks like. Positive peace is defined as a more lasting peace built on investment and economic development, as well as sustained institutions and attitudes that foster peace. Of the eight pillars of positive peace defined by the Institute of Economics and Peace, a well-functioning government is the first one. Stormont laid dormant for the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement, as it did for the 25th. With other 10 years of mothballing, can we really say that this structure is a success? Now, that's the, the bleak stuff over. I'm looking forward now. <laughs> to the future, despite systemic failures, Northern Ireland is a hopeful society. And despite our politics still remaining quite divided, the people are not. The return of Northern Ireland's assembly alongside momentum towards a vote on the constitutional future of Ireland, suggests that we are entering a new phase in the peace process. Looking to the present, a two-track approach is needed to provide stability in Northern Ireland, reform of the institutions, and an implementation strategy for outstanding socio-economic rights under the Good Friday Agreement. The restoration of the assembly should provide a vehicle for reform, and indeed First Minister Michelle O'Neill has said that a storming committee should now examine the possibility of reforming the institutions. The lack of a functioning executive has a real-world impact. Adoption and social care legislation stalled after the 2020 collapse, whilst Westminster has had to intervene to pass an emergency Northern Ireland budget, and also intervened in legislating for abortion rights and Irish language legislation. Change isn't just desirable, it is necessary. <coughs> I recently interviewed young people about their views on politics in Northern Ireland. It did make me feel very hopeful. But also there was quite a bit of criticism. 21-year-old Matthew Taylor said, the biggest problem with the Good Friday Agreement is that it's been seen as this will do, instead of we can improve this, we, we can change things, we can make things better, make things fairer, that's never an attitude you should have towards politics. You should always try and make it better. Reforming how Stormont operates is not unheard of, but it does pose challenges. Many contend that changes made in the St. Andrews Agreement in 2007 distorted the original intent of the Good Friday Agreement, creating further vetoes which have subsequently been abused. In 2020 alone, 
the DUP used the cross-community veto established under the St. Andrew's veto um, agreement four times in efforts to veto COVID-19 rules and abortion rights. Under the Good Friday Agreement, cross-community vetoes were supposed to be safeguards linked to compliance with human rights and equality standards. Review of the institutions is actually a baked-in mechanism within the agreement. The agreement was never intended to be untouchable, but rather, like all living documents, would be capable of evolving as society does. <coughs> Northern Ireland has changed drastically since 1998. And it may just be that some things that were necessary then are not necessary today. It could be argued that the agreement has in some ways locked in identity politics with the fact that our politicians have to designate as unionist or nationalist and considering that the majority of the population don't see themselves this way, why are we still asking our politicians to do so? However, rather than close party talks or a limited storm and committee, I believe people should be brought back into this peace process. New decade, new approach, the 2020 agreement that restored the assembly included a commitment to hold one citizen's assembly every year. A Northern Ireland citizen's assembly on storm and reform would be an ideal vehicle for examining changes. On wider reviews and implementation for outstanding commitments in the agreement, there are three key things that can be done. First, is a critical independent analysis of implementation. Part of this examination should be on the continuing necessity of certain measures today and whether reform would lead to greater delivery of the original aims. For example, Northern Ireland's doomed civic forum. The concept was to develop a consultative space for civic society that complements representative democracy. But the process and design of these spaces, as well as the growth of deliberative democracy, lends to the idea that a new approach may be more relevant than the original structure. Likewise, the exclusion of the Alliance Party representatives from cross-community voting in 1998 may have seemed less outrageous when they had six seats, but today at 17, it is patently undemocratic. Second is to develop an implementation strategy, followed thirdly by an external third party monitor. There is empirical evidence that peace agreements most often fail at the implementation stage. Political resistance, ambiguities in the text, of which there are many, and institutional inertia all coalesce to hinder progress. Effective monitoring in post-conflict societies is crucial to prevent relapse, as is having an ambitious socioeconomic delivery for the island. Looking on from there, it is my belief that Ireland is likely to hold a border poll within the next decade. Since the 2016 vote, conversations around reunification have become mainstreamed. There is, at this point, barely a day that is going by where there is not a debate or a radio program or a column or an event that is happening about this conversation. Universities across Ireland and the UK are undertaking research on constitutional change. Ireland's upper chamber is examining Ireland's constitutional future, and grassroots campaign groups have already been established to prepare for a referendum. On the pro-union side, we have groups like former First Minister Arlene Foster's Together UK, and on the pro-reunification side, we have civic groups like Ireland's Future, with the CEO in the room here tonight, shout out to Jerry, um, who have delivered several publications and have organized large-scale conferences. The UK's departure for the European Union fundamentally altered the conversations around the United Ireland. Reunification is now no longer just about ideology, it's about <coughs> economics and a return to the European Union. Opinion polling shows that two-thirds of people in Northern Ireland think that Brexit makes the United Ireland more likely. And in a special business post Red Sea poll in 2022, a clear majority of Southern respondents stated that they would vote in favor of constitutional change. A recent Lucid Talk Sunday Times survey showed that 57% of 18 to 24 year olds in Northern Ireland would vote yes to reunify with Ireland if a border poll was held today. 
despite there being no official campaign or unity plan. Polls and surveys consistently demonstrate that the Good Friday Agreement generation are more likely to vote for United Ireland, more likely to identify as Irish or Northern Irish, and the vast majority do not align themselves with unionist ideology, all of which suggests pro-union parties are likely to face an uphill battle in selling Northern Ireland's place in the union to this generation. More broadly, polling has also failed to show reliable support for maintaining Northern Ireland's position within the United Kingdom, with percentages of those who vote to remain consistently falling below 50%. A point for consideration about the question, if a border poll was held today, would you vote to rejoin or reunify with Ireland, or would you vote to remain in the United Kingdom? There is, at present, no plan, no detail, no vision as to what a United Ireland might look like. So people are being asked a question based on limited information, ideology, and emotions. Polling results might change considerably when a plan emerges. A United Ireland with an NHS-style healthcare system, a new constitution, new governance structures, and an ambitious all island economic plan. They might all be more appealing. Certainly for me, as a Fermanagh woman, where we have no railway, I think trains for Fermanagh would probably be very successful. <laughs> there are several steps that the Irish government could be taking, some would say should be taking, to prepare for a border poll. Certainly, if Brexit is anything for us to learn by. The first step is representation. <coughs> there are currently no Northern Ireland representatives within the political institutions in Dublin. Ideally, a Northern panel would be established in the Shannon as part of much needed and long overdue reform of Ireland's second chamber. But in the absence of such a panel, three seats representing the three dominant communities in Northern Ireland should be reserved within the Taoiseach's nominations. Expanding voting rights would also begin to chip away at the divisions north and south. The current government committed to holding a referendum to extend presidential voting rights, and unfortunately it does look like that referendum will not be held in this term. The second step is research. Universities and academics across these islands are exploring various aspects of constitutional change, but government-funded research into areas such as pensions, the civil <coughs> service, Policing justice would be invaluable and signal a serious effort and intent towards addressing these complex issues head on. One of the most critical aspects in preparing for a border poll is dialogue and an all island citizens assembly, which some pro-unity parties do advocate for, is in my view not going to cut it. The citizens assembly model has proved highly effective but it is too limited in its reach to build the level of understanding necessary in this debate. What Ireland really needs is a national dialogue. And I say this as someone who writes predominantly for a Republic of Ireland audience and who works as a cross-border worker. Often there's a narrative that Northern Ireland is still very divided, but I believe the greatest division in Ireland is North and South between the people. The national dialogue model which includes large-scale interventions within communities in the form of town halls, forums, and smaller-scale dialogue sessions form part of Colombia's peace process, and has been praised as an example to the world of transformative impacts of dialogue. Pinning our future on the Citizens' Assembly model lacks imagination. We need to be much more ambitious about reaching people in their communities. In terms of resources, there currently are none. Professor, P Professor Brendan O'Leary has suggested that the Irish government ring fence part of the budget surplus set to reach 10 billion this year and up to 65.2 billion by 2027 into sovereign wealth fund to prepare for unification. The government has announced that it will set up such a fund, but for pensions. There is momentum building around 2030 as a potential year for a border poll. Six years might seem like a long time, but it's been almost eight years since Brexit, 
and the debate on constitutional change still remains at a very surface level area. We don't have answers or a vision for key areas such as healthcare, education, housing, governance. A border poll, in my view, will be a once in a generation opportunity to fundamentally alter the social fabric of Ireland. But for this to be a success, resources have to be allocated now. Northern Ireland is not thriving within the United Kingdom. It is at the bottom of the league table on household discretionary income and has the highest economic inactivity rate in the UK. For many, constitutional change represents opportunity, a return to the European Union, a free at the point of access health service, a chance to renew investment in rural Ireland, to decentralise governance, to have her say on creating a new, inclusive, modern Irish society. But change is also scary. It's the unknown. And there exists, across the island of Ireland, hundreds of thousands of people just waiting for something that they can believe in. And with that, I'm done. Thank you. Tour de force, and um, so many is interesting issues that you raised. Uh, one, the first one I'm thinking of is the dilemma posed by timing. If we go too soon with a poll, it could be like Scotland and end up being rejected because people are fearful and uh, feel things are going wrong. If we go too late, the situation in Northern Ireland may deteriorate even more. And one, one columnist talked about the end of days, which may be an exaggeration, but clearly time is not helping. Uh, the situation out there. So how do, how does one reconcile that? Does that mean certainly stepping up the pace of fleshing out what a referendum would be discussing in contrast with Brexit? Um, is that what, what and you, you mentioned putting a date out there like 2030, is that an incentive to try and get something to happen rather than putting on the long finger endlessly? Well I think, thank you Ted, that's a great question. And you're right to highlight that there is a real balance to strike here. I think that the issue around preparing for a border poll is that we can't control the timelines. Um, the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland will call a border poll if and when they believe um, it is likely that people will vote in favour for a United Ireland. And we have no detail as to what measures the Secretary of State will use to gauge that interest. And I think there's also a risk in, um, if you look at Germany for example, change happened very fast in the end. So my view would be that the important thing to do is to prepare the, uh, now because you can't, you can't control the timeline. So say the Secretary of State wanted to call a referendum in six months and I'm sure they would know that it would fail because people would not vote for the unknown. Um, so there's a risk of that happening and in order to address that the work can get done now. So there's nothing to stop the Irish government actually in a national dialogue, having these conversations, there's nothing to stop research being undertaken. All of these things can be done and shouldn't be seen as, as a threat or, or seen as controversial or seen as divisive because we have to remember that aspiring to unify the end of Ireland is part of the Good Friday Agreement and is equally as legitimate as aspiring to keep Northern Ireland within the United Kingdom. And I think there is sometimes a nervousness um, around taking that step towards preparing. But if you look at the contrast of Brexit, there's a real danger in not preparing people for this vote. And if you look at the Scottish model, Scotland took two years to prepare for the referendum and it failed. In the context of Ireland, I think it would take much longer to figure out this stuff because even if you look at education, we have two wildly divergent education systems and figuring out what an all island education system would look like would take time. What's going to happen to the civil service? What's going to happen to the healthcare service? What's going to happen to the road markings? What color are the post boxes going to be? The list is endless. You know, and what about Tato? This is going to be a really divisive debate, okay? Is it going to be Northern Tato or is it going to be Free Stato? So there's a lot that needs to get fleshed out. And I think that the way that, that can happen is by having those resources put in by the government. For example, there's been suggestions around having a um, committee set up. Um, around examining unification, there's nothing wrong with doing that, that would be a good thing. 
um, having a unification minister, having these national dialogues called, all of these would be welcome steps. Uh, yes, I'll, I'll go ahead, Laura. Did you want to? Um, um, thank you, Emma, for such a clear and, and compelling uh, presentation. I have a couple of questions. The first is you gave us an indication of sentiment in Northern Ireland on a united Ireland if a referendum took place today, admittedly without a plan. Uh, what figure would you give us if, uh, for sentiment in the Republic? Uh, for, uh, for the same uh, goal. That's my first question. The other question is a little more um, general and external, but I wanted to ask you about uh, the significance of immigration and refugees in uh, Northern Ireland today. Uh, obviously, that's the one of the hot button issues in, in the election here with uh, both of the presumptive candidates uh, down at the southern border today. And it's also my, it's my specialty field, and it's also the field in which I'm mentoring uh, one of your emerging uh, Northern Ireland uh, leaders uh, who's trying to figure out what a refugee policy might look like uh, in Northern Ireland and whether that's a local issue or, or a central issue. It's a familiar refrain in Irish history, uh, who's in charge? Is this a central responsibility, responsibility or local? But my, my thoughts are, are, are these. Um, what's, what's happened in the Republic is extraordinary. Uh, we read that one in five of residents uh, of the Republic are foreign born. That's 20%. Uh, in, in the United States today, there are 50 million foreign born people. But that, as a percentage of the population, is 15%. And, so, and this is, you know, the nation of immigrants, and the figure has never been higher than 15%. So something really extraordinary is, is happening uh, in, in, on the island of Ireland uh, to do with immigration. And, you know, for a long time we rested on our liberal law, laurels and said, oh, that's a good thing. Well, of course it's a good thing to, to me as an immigrant and a scholar of immigration. I look on immigration in the most positive of ways. It's one thing to have lots of foreign-born people in the country. It's another thing to have a plan for integrating them. And I think, I think we, we, we had a rude awakening uh, uh, last year uh, in, in Dublin. You know, to say that what happened on the streets of Dublin has nothing to do with immigration and nothing to do with inequality is, to me, very, a very facile thing to say. Uh, even if the issue was manipulated. The issue of immigration was, was manipulated in the context of inequality. So that brings me to my question about Northern Ireland, um, the significance of the immigrant presence, of the refugee presence, and I imagine it's double-edged, right? Because on the one hand, we read about bad things, but on the other hand, the fact of immigration, the bringing in of new people, new cultures, is one of the great transformative forces in any society for breaking down barriers. So I wonder if you, if you could talk about this, the small question at the beginning and then the bigger okay. question. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, okay, on the Republic sentiment towards um, United Ireland, polling indicates that um, at a surface level it's a yes, a majority would vote. Now if you change that question, you ask would you vote for United Ireland if you had to pay more taxes? Would you vote for United Ireland if you had to change the flag? Would you vote for United Ireland if you had to change the national anthem? And you quickly find support dwindles um, with these questions. And I think what that points to is a couple of things. One, the need to have serious all island conversations around why these changes might be necessary. Certainly as someone who was born in Northern Ireland and has grown up in Northern Ireland, there's a really strong case to be made for why changing national symbols would actually be really important. Because flags are weaponized in Northern Ireland. And it's not just that you're trying to accommodate another identity, it's that Irish people in Northern Ireland have for a very long time witnessed their national flag being burned on bonfires or seen flags used as territory markers. And when you're talking there about the um, 1 in 5 uh, in the Republic, it's 1 in 15 in Northern Ireland as well, so it's you know becoming more diverse too. 
the island of Ireland is a much more diverse, multicultural society, and I believe that national symbols in the event of constitutional change should reflect that diversity, and that it would be really exciting to be able to actually have a say on your flag. I mean, if you put it out to a referendum and people had, you know, two choices or whatever it was, that sounds pretty exciting to me. I mean, how many of us get to vote on our national flag? So, but I think that having those conversations is the challenge. Um, I think whenever I've had conversations with people and I've been part of debates where we've had those conversations, there's a lot of room for people to compromise. But if they're not given that space to have those conversations, you get these kinds of responses and polling. Well, the bigger question around immigration and refugee integration. In the Northern Irish context, refugees are just outside of the sectarianism of Northern Ireland, so they are an afterthought in every shape and form and when it comes to reporting of, of hate crimes, when it comes to addressing hate crimes, race-related crimes, it's not reported on, the reporting is far lower than it is in other parts of the United Kingdom, and so for that reason, um, really this is a whole cohort of people who are left out of the system, and if you look even at representation, I mean, how many representatives do we have uh, for a place that has more than 15 that weren't born in the UK or Ireland? But that's also reflected across the border. You know, how many people do we have in elected office um, in the Republic of Ireland um, who represent and come from a different community? So we do have this challenge of integration and really embracing that kind of multicultural society around developing refugee um, integration policies in the Northern Irish context. The UK Home Office deals with immigration, but certainly uh, the Assembly would have remit around having their own integration um, policies, and that would be something that we really need. When it comes to the elections this year, I think immigration, much like here in the US, is going to become a big factor. And part of the challenge is, yes, the socioeconomic undercurrents, they do play a factor. The weaponization of immigration is a big issue, but also it's about how our politicians speak to people in their communities about refugee integration, about immigration. In the Irish context, there's but a lack of transparency from political leaders around immigration statistics, around strategies for um, refugee housing, and that kind of creates a space where nefarious forces and those who seek to weaponize immigration can then create this kind of division. So there's a couple of things that need to be done, and it starts really with political leadership. Hi, John McAuliffe. Uh, Frank, Frank um, Connolly in his book United Nation uses the term reintegration more than reunification and you just used the term and that struck me when I met him and read the book that that puts a different conceptual framework around it and he also stresses the need for, as you are, lots and lots of very detailed conversations happening. Two, my wife and I made trips the last two years and were struck driving from Donegal to Derry that it was very hard to tell you moved from one country to another. And that's very different than when I was in the North 40 years ago. And, and so the, the question, part of it is whether there's a reality beneath the surface that is happening um, how many people in the North now have passports for the Republic? Is there a current figure on that? What percentage of economic production from the North is now flowing through the South to the EU rather than going through uh, England? Um, how, how much of, uh, on the practical side of life, regardless of what people talk about and say and symbols, how much is the reality simply changing so quickly that that uh, people will wake up one day and it will have happened in effect. Uh, that may be too sanguine a view of somebody who's coming for a week or two and not understanding the levels of tension that still exist, but that was was the kind of top of mind. I had one other question, which is the, ex the kind of role that you see people like me, the, the Americans of Irish descent, 
the kinds of people here tonight, the kinds of folks who will be at the conference tomorrow. How much of a role do you see? Is it a positive or negative role? Or should we just stay, stand back and, and let the process find its own, own path? Um, and since the speaker, someone is here from, from uh, Ireland's future, I don't know whether their conference in June, June 15th in Belfast, whether they're hoping to get a lot of, of Ameri North Americans coming or whether, again, the sense is that's really got to be an internal process. Thank you. Great questions. Um, on the integration that's already happening, I live on the border. Um, I'm five miles from the border. And especially in border communities, there is no border. Um, people are largely integrated. We don't see each other as as being any different um, on the island of Ireland. I, I like to say sometimes that politics and people are two very different things. So politics across the island can still be quite divisive, but people are largely reconciled and most certainly want the same things. They want a better life for themselves and their children. They want better opportunities, and they're no different whether they're in Northern Ireland or on the other side of the border. Where tension begins to show is in this debate around the idea that constitutional change would change the current Irish state. And I think part of that aversion to change is really in the history of partition. Because when the island was partitioned, we basically had two different, two different concepts of Irishness develop on the island of Ireland. We had Irish citizens in Northern Ireland who had a very different experience from those on the other side of the border. And the Republic of Ireland, Irish citizens were free to really define their Irish identity, and in many ways it was defined against uh, being British, and developed a very strong, independent, proud tradition as an Irish nation. Even looking at the tricolour, the tricolour as a flag is, you know, really actually quite a recent flag. But that is the flag of the Republic of Ireland. And that identity that has been developed, changing that for the, for the North is difficult. For, for people in the Republic, and that's where the tension is. Around um, the question of US involvement, I think, look at the peace process, the success of the peace process, and you know, US intervention played a pretty critical role in us being able to have a successful Good Friday Agreement. I think that there is so much that we can learn from each other, from each other's experiences, particularly in the context of the US and Ireland, and that that learning from each other is how we can find compromise, different approaches, different ways forward, and conversations on what the island of Ireland might look like. They aren't reserved just for happening on the island of Ireland. Spaces like this tonight and events that are happening tomorrow are just as important in building new forms of understanding, but also new ideas on what we might be able to do, new approaches. So I think actually the U.S. has a really important role to play. And when I say the U.S., I don't just mean the U.S. government. I mean each and every person who aspires to unite the island of Ireland, who believes that Ireland might have a border pool and wants to see that being done in a fair, democratic way where people can have their say, everyone has a role to play in that. Do you have numbers on the passport? Yeah, I think at the last count, I think at the last count, it's sitting at around 800,000 Irish passports. Hi, hi Emma. Um, I'm also from Northern Ireland, so um, welcome. Another sort of local voice. Um, I've got a couple of questions, actually. Um, one, um, you spoke about the brain drain. I'm kind of part of that brain drain. Um, and a huge number of my friends are working in Britain, and I'm here, and I'll go back to Britain next, um, in September. And we leave for jobs. And I wonder what you think the position of us would be in a border poll. Like, do you think that people who are working in Britain but not currently living in Northern Ireland will be able to vote, even if we were born and raised there? And how the role of people that are part of that brain drain will play in the future of where we're from. And we, we, I would love to live there still, but I can't get a job in my field. 
So I went to London and now I'm in New York and then I'll probably go back to London and see where I get a job. So yeah, the, the role of people in that almost, I don't, I hes hesitate to say it's a little mini diaspora, but there is a kind of brain drain diaspora of people from Northern Ireland who'd love to be at home, but can't be there for whatever reason. Um, so that's one question. So the next one is how you see our relationship with Britain if we did reunite with Ireland, given that a lot of people are working and family are living in Britain, and there is a very strong connection to Britain, whether we, you know, you like that ideologically or in a sort of political sense, there are very strong Scottish connections, for example, for a huge part of the Northern Irish population. I have family in Scotland, like the strong Celtic connection. So what's the kind of um, relationship you see there if we did have a United Ireland? Um, sort of like politically, relationally, well obviously we have movements like agreements for the free movement of people between Britain and Ireland, but what kind of other vision of that relationship do you see given that there are just practically a lot of people that have family that cross both islands and economic connections and all the rest of it? Um, and then I, I guess my sort of, you presented it a kind of positive vision of the future. What if people didn't vote for it, north or south, the south didn't accept us? That's a possibility, there's a lot of money involved, peace is expensive. And people might not go for this vision of um, changing things in the South to, to make room for what the North brings, which is a lot of complexity. We bring a lot of identity issues for a very small <coughs> population. Um, we have many, including my accent, that adds a layer to my identity issues. You can hear how much I've moved in my voice. So yeah, there's still three parts to the question, and I appreciate your perspective on any of those. Well, look, you're not alone, because um, I often get told when I'm back home, whereabouts in America are you from? So, also a very confused accent, and I completely blame my American husband for that, who I clearly must listen to too much. Um, but, uh, great questions, three-barrel question, I love a three-part question, I'm a big fan of it, big fan of it, always do it. Um, to the point around the role of young people, I think look at the referendums that happened in the Republic, and the significant home-to-vote movement we had for uh, equal marriage, and um, repealing the Eighth Amendment. I mean those scenes of young people coming back to the airport and being greeted when they got home and it was just, there was so much joy I think in those referendums. I'd really like to see um, those who have had to leave uh, Northern Ireland, often through no choice of their own, whether that's for economic opportunities, for university, for whatever those reasons are, be able to have their say in that referendum. I think it's really important. How that will work will be determined by those uh, who are in charge. For each referendum has a different cohort, but certainly in my campaigning work, I'd be advocating to ensure that those voices are included because I think they should be. Um, on the point around the relationship with Britain, we have structures within the Good Friday Agreement. Um, strand three relates to the relationships between um, Ireland, Northern Ireland, and the UK. Those structures continue in the event of constitutional change. The Good Friday Agreement doesn't just disappear after um, a vote. It does continue, and that um, principle of working together across these items, that's maintained in the event of constitutional change. So things like the British-Irish Intergovernmental Conference and um, the different structures that we have within that, I think, would be essential for those to remain. So there's co cooperation at a political level. And of course, then we have things like the Common Travel Area, which would also be continuing. I mean, there's no no universe in which we could not have a close relationship with the rest of the UK. Like, that is the reality of where we live, and there's actually a great strength in that relationship that we have uh, when it's used and, and, and utilized effectively. So I think in the event of constitutional change, there will still be a very strong relationship with the rest of the UK. Um, what if a vote didn't work? Yeah, that is a, that's a scary prospect. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I think that if there's not enough preparation done, it's not impossible that, that could happen. I think ultimately, even though the polling indicates that the Republic is nervous around these ideas of change and anything, I still think the Republic would vote yes. It'd probably just be a smaller margin, you know, it could be a 51, 52%. It's not a great turnout for their referendums full stop. I mean, the Good Friday Agreement referendum had a 94% yes vote in the Republic of Ireland. Only 56% went out to vote, so a lot of people stayed home. Um, so I think that it would still pass. I think in the Northern Ireland context, that's where the concern would be that it won't pass. And I think the big breaking points are going to be the health service, 
I mean, there's an enormous emotional attachment to the NHS, despite the fact that when you go to A&E, you're sat there for like 16 hours trying to get seen to, and you can't see your GP anymore, and the health service is completely crumbling. But at an emotional level, there's some kind of connection that people have with the NHS, you know. So I think that's going to be a big question for people. And also governance, pensions. If we look at the Scottish model, it kind of came down to money in the end too. So if you don't get those questions worked out in advance, my concern is that a vote would fail. Now within the agreement, there's a mechanism to have another vote in seven years following that. But I just think it would be so enormously damaging for the referendum not to pass. I think emotionally, it'd be very difficult, especially for us authorities, you know, because we've already been so rejected before. So, <laughs> thank you. So, Emma, I have a question. It's an easy one for you. You mentioned um, at from about age five, children are separated, and that's because education is segregated. And you also mentioned that um, education. Having two educational systems costs a lot of money, perhaps money that could be otherwise used in different ways. So what are your ideas on how to reform or change the education system? Like de desegregated, I guess would be the word, but you know, to bring um, communities together and not have you know, the Catholic school, the Protestant school, and, and those divisions. Yeah, I mean, look, it takes a lot of political will, Susan, actually, because um, there has been money available for integrated education schemes. There's been a lot of investment from the U.S. even around integrated education, but there's often a lack of political appetite um, from really not just one party, from, from a number of parties that are adverse to the idea of advancing integrated education to a, to a large degree. Oftentimes it's parents that have to push to be able to get integrated status, and a lot of responsibility is placed on their shoulders to be able to try and have um, a campaign and develop that kind of policy for shifting it. Um, there was um, some bad news last week where now that the assembly is back, um, which was the great news that we got, uh, we were then informed that 150 million of funding for the education system has been stripped away and 10 schools that were meant to have new buildings will no longer have those new buildings and it just so happens that all 10 are integrated schools. So we do see consistent stripping away of, of support and funding for integrated education, and that's a significant challenge. There's also a need to have a really, really strong information campaign around what is integrated education, because there is some nervousness within communities who feel like if their two schools integrated, would their religious ethos disappear? Would their children not be taught those values that were important to them? And where I am from in Fermanagh, in Five Mile Town, it's a very small population, 1,200 people population for the village that I am currently living near. There are two schools, um, one Catholic school, one state school, and the Catholic school is at risk of closure because it doesn't have enough students, but they don't want to integrate the two schools because they're nervous about what that would mean. So there really has to be a lot of work done here around what is integrated education, what does integrated education really look like, and supporting parents and having a say in that decision but ultimately it comes from a political level without the political support to advance integrated education it's not going to advance i would like to see integrated education as the dominant system uh, in northern ireland i'd also like to see religious studies taken to outside of state schools um, i'd also like to completely reform the curriculum and in place put in um, philosophy i study philosophy so i'm a big advocate for it I think that if you look at schools in Europe that have advocated for it, it really does help build an understanding of yourself and others and build understanding in a post-conflict society. I just think it would be so, so critical in, in helping people address some of those issues. And of course, I would like to see the Good Friday Agreement be mandatory in the education system yeah. along with the conflict. So. Well, and you know, we heard when I was just there back in April from a lot of people, and I don't remember that from when I lived there, you know, when I was Consul General, is that... Um, They'd like to send their children to integrated schools, but there's this, and I don't know if it's a perception or if it's a reality, schools aren't as good as the other two choices. Mm -hmm. And is that really, you know, the case, would you say? Or, and so then people are afraid and then they don't. Yeah, you know, I think that comes back to the information campaign. Oh, yeah, for the. Oh, yeah, for the um, yeah, I think um, the question around there being a, a concern if integrated schools are not as good, I think it is a perception <coughs> issue. 
I think that there, that goes back to the point of when there having to be an information campaign around what integrated education actually means, but also the fact that integrated schools and better together schools are being stripped away from funding, it does have an impact on the delivery of services. We have one back here. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Aaron uh, from the metropolis of Antrim. Um, <laughs> another uh, three-parter for you. Uh, oh, great, I'm ready. Uh, do you think there was any mistake in the Good Friday Agreement in encouraging two separate identities rather than cultivating the Northern Irish identity? Um, I suppose second part, uh, why not? Um, I suppose you, uh, you spoke of living on the border community where you, you cross the border and you're very much the same people. But do you think after 100 years, Northern Ireland and Republic of Ireland are the same people? You know, can you can you say that Pakistan and India are still the same people? You know, is there really a are we culturally the same? Um, and then uh, third part, Craig, what was I talking about? Earlier? I've just forgotten. So I was using my friend Craig as a, as a ploy. Oh, it's a really good one as well. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. Uh, what was it? <laughs> Sorry, folks, I've derailed this by. Answer the two and then you okay, can Okay, I'll back come back to you. Have it. All right. <laughs> Do I think there was a flaw in the two identities? I actually went to an um, event recently where I was listening to somebody who uh, originally came from Jamaica and who now lives in Northern Ireland, and Northern Ireland is their home. And they said that they really perceived the Good Friday Agreement as being very exclusionary to any other identities and that it locked in this idea of two communities and that um, they didn't even perceive the agreement as anything other than a ceasefire agreement because in their view all it had achieved was an end of conflict and it hadn't actually built reconciliation because it didn't include everybody else in the conversation. So I think there are some strong arguments to be made. I think at the time it was a different society. In 1998 I think it was really important to have you know, the fact that we were trying to have representation from the unionist community and the nationalist community ensuring people weren't being left out. I think today it's not so relevant and the fact that we're still stuck in this binary idea of unionist or nationalist and I mean we're talked about like that all the time. We're talked about that like that in Dublin, we're talked about, you know, talked about like that here in the US too, the unionist community, the nationalist community. What about everybody else? And I think that that's an issue, and I think it's kind of rooted in the fact that that's how the agreement was framed. I do think it would be good to look at moving beyond that. Um, in terms of are people North and South the same? Culturally, of course not. People in Northern Ireland, um, and people from Ballymena and Fermanagh are not the same, you know? But in the same way that people from Cork are a completely different breed. Okay, from people in Dublin. <laughs> you know? um, Carry through. Uh, I think having a localized identity, a cultural identity, is is actually a really healthy sign for a society. And Northern Ireland does have a very strong local identity. The Northern Irish identity, the Northern Irish, the Nordies, is actually a cultural identity. I think that has been established, and it's it's established through all the things that are unique to us. You know, like Johnny's Causeway and potato bread, like we definitely have the best fry across the islands, best, best fry, the also fry hands down. So that's a, I think a positive thing, it's a good thing. Um, and I would like to see it embraced more and not politicized so much, because you do see the Northern Irish identity being politicized. You have some people saying, well, it must be a unionist identity because they're Northern Irish. And you have others saying, well, it must be an Irish identity because they're Northern Irish. And you know, why can't we just be just being Northern Irish, shouldn't that be okay? Or even just the Irish. Mm -hmm. Okay, I did remember. Okay, good. Um, yeah, it was just on uh, legacy. I guess, you know, obviously Northern Ireland, we haven't been able to solve legacy. How does this, how does United Ireland solve something we haven't been able to solve in the last 25 years? Yeah, I mean, look, the legacy stuff is really tricky. And of course, yesterday we did have um, a high court ruling in Belfast about the UK government's uh, quite controversial Legacy Act. And really, I should probably have talked about that in my opening remarks. Um, the problem about the Legacy in Northern Ireland is it was actually really largely absent from the Good Friday Agreement. Um, and later, um, in one of the subsequent agreements, we had the Stormont House Agreement, 
which was between the Irish and British governments looking at how to try and address the legacy of conflict. Um, of course, like all the other agreements, it's never been fully implemented. Really, we have a very big problem with implementation. Um, and in the meantime, these families, um, these victims and survivors, their children, their brothers, their sisters, have had to spend their entire lives going through arduous court systems and trying to find some degree of truth or justice. And subsequently, after Stormont House was failed um, to be delivered, the UK government brought forward the Legacy Act, um, the Northern Ireland Troubles Legacy and Reconciliation Act. They had to put reconciliation in there. But you can't force reconciliation on people. And the act was fundamentally flawed. Um, it did the inconceivable in that it managed to unite all of Northern Ireland's political parties with the Irish government, uh, with um, you know, uh, the US, with the EU, in being opposed um, to this um, legislation. Despite that, the UK government proceeded. It's largely considered that the legislation was brought forward to protect, uh, protect veterans. Um, and that it actually does not do anything for um, families, victims, and survivors. Yesterday, the High Court ruled that the legislation is incompatible with the European Convention on Human Rights, the Human Rights Act as well, and also incompatible with Article 2 of the Withdrawal Agreement and Windsor Framework. So, incompatible with a whole smorgasbord of international <coughs> human rights standards. Yet, the UK government has said it is committed to implementing the Legacy Act in full. So we'll see how that ends. In the meantime, um, victims and families are having to go through more court proceedings and frankly, they are dying. Um, they are dying waiting for justice. So how do you address that? I think that we have to go back to the principles of Stormont House. Where there is agreement is where we should start. And going back to that principle um, of bringing forward that legislation is I think the only viable solution to address it. And then I want to right. yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, uh, well, we sat through uh, Irish America's activism in uh, in the legacy issue, right? And yeah. it was a very profound uh, activity. And I think what we found is that a lot of the ignorance in in what uh, needs to be done to help people in the island of Ireland is not going to come from people that aren't paying attention to the island of Ireland. And we were just in a meeting recently uh, with a parliamentary committee that's focused on the North of Ireland. And it was kind of shocking to see that even in that little group of people, uh, there are parts of the UK that really don't understand the complex issues of the North. So I, I, I would say, what could one part of the island do for the other part of the island to prove that if they were united, just to give an example, I think you mentioned one of them, you come from a certain place that doesn't have a rail system. Uh, what, what immediate uh, examples could Ireland do to show the people in the six counties that if they did merge, uh, the second part is that education is all so important because when we were in Belfast 25, um, we met students that really hate Brexit, except the students that are from parts of England who are not affected by it. So again, if we're going to depend on a country to help us with this that really doesn't educate its own people on the island of Ireland, what can the United States, Irish Americans do, and what can the Republic of Ireland do to prove that this is a good move? Thank you, Dan. Great questions. And it would be remiss of me not to go back to the fact that, um, you know, I think it would be a really positive step for Fermanagh residents if we had trains. Um, or the other four counties that don't have any rail structures. And I don't think it's a coincidence that the counties that don't have any rail infrastructure are all on the border. Um, so I think that that kind of investment would really be an indicator of intent. But uh, beyond them suddenly rolling out um, loads of very expensive rail lines, uh, some kind of all-island regional development strategy, I think, would be a really good um, signal of intent. Also looking at how to improve investment in rural border counties as well, because if you look at the Northwest, I mean, 
Donegal is not a part of Northern Ireland, but it is also completely forgotten about by um, Dublin. It's just up there uh, and no one uh, really thinks much about it, apart from whenever we all vacation there around the 12th. Um, so I think having some kind of um, all island regional development strategy that is boosting um, rural Ireland would actually be a very significant um, signal of intent. And I say rural Ireland because Ireland is actually a rural country. 40% of the population lives rurally, but in terms of its infrastructure and investment, those communities don't see it. Uh, so I think that would be a good point. Um, on the other point where you're asking around um, the second part of your question, Dan, you're going to remind me what was the second part of your well, question. Well, you know, I, I, oh, the, I, I, oh, my Irish, no, I got you, Irish American. So <coughs> I think that this is going to be a very difficult conversation for a lot of people in Ireland. And there's a really important role that Irish Americans can play in getting people to have a difficult conversation by creating an open space, by being someone who can facilitate those kind of discussions and encourage people to face those kind of challenges and listening to the concerns and being a sounding board and being supportive and encouraging conversations, encouraging debate. I think that's a really important role to play. I think that ultimately people in Ireland will need help and support in being able to take forward what will be an enormously significant referendum and in the event of constitutional change, a significant um, change to the island of Ireland. And I go back to the point I was making earlier about that being something that everyone has a role in. Uh, and as we as we draw to a close, um, oh, I just want to. As we draw, as we draw, question. Uh, as we draw to a close, uh, I believe that a rather Brennan Blacksman uh, would like to ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, any other questions? I, I think in this room there might just be. I feel like this room has, has been a little yeah, yeah, loud. Yeah, yeah, just one. Yeah. Is there anybody in there? Uh, one person here. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. And I thank you again for a wonderful talk. Uh, Erskine Childers here. I just wanted to say, uh, you know, you just ended your uh, your uh, little explanation with difficult conversations. Um, John John Hume is revered in this building, as is Senator Mitchell, and. Uh, I really feel, I've been following you for a few years, I followed the court case specifically where I first saw you and your presence, and I just want to say keep going. Keep going on social media. We need the ear of 18, 25 year olds. Keep going. Um, I had a question. I'm not a supporter of, uh, of uh, SF, but I'm Curious as to your opinion and viewpoint about uh, the next election, potentially, in the Republic of Ireland. Um, and even though I don't believe in the Red Sea too much, um, you mentioned it several times, and going by polling, it's pretty clear what's coming. So if you could just comment on that briefly. Thank you for the really kind, supportive uh, remarks. Um, the polling and the elections. Um, yeah, I do think it's very likely that Sinn Féin will emerge as the largest party in the Republic in the next election. I th think it will be slimmer than some of the polling suggests because we know that polls always tighten closer to election day. It's just what happens. I think if Sinn Féin is smart, they will run a sheer majority, like just as many candidates as they possibly can. Because if you look at the last election, uh, they could have actually had more in if they ran more candidates. And in Northern Ireland, the local elections, like they far surpassed even the highest expectations of commentators like myself um, in terms of the numbers that they delivered. And they probably could have got more seats if they ran more as well. So uh, strategically, they should really capitalize on that and run a lot of candidates in the election. I'm sure they will be doing that. Do I think they will have an outright majority? No. And the challenge is going to be who will be their partners in government. I think if it ends up being another coalition between Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil, despite the fact that Sinn Féin might have the largest amount of seats, I don't think the, that the public would really like that outcome. Uh, I do think it is possible that Fianna Fáil might go into government with um, Sinn Féin. Uh, my prediction would be that Fine Gael is already preparing for opposition. They have the highest level of their TDs are not running for re-election in a very long time. And I think that's an indicator that they expect that they're not actually going to go back into government. 
I don't think it would be a bad thing for Fine Gael to go into opposition. There is benefits to being in opposition, as we see Sinn Féin has utilised it very effectively. I think it's possible, therefore, that we're looking at probably a coalition between Sinn Féin and Fianna Fáil after the next election. I'm not 100% sure if Micheál Martin would still be the leader. There is speculation that he might go for the presidential ticket or potentially to Europe where he also uh, would be well received. So could be a lot of change in Ireland um, in the next 12 months. Also worth noting we have the elections in the UK happening. I mean actually just in general there's just elections happening everywhere this year. It's a bonanza year for elections. Um, but in terms of um, in the UK there will also be those elections. Sinn Féin might get more seats in Westminster as well. And I think that will that shift the tide on conversations around unity? Yes, I think it will. But I don't expect unity to be Sinn Féin's number one priority. When they go in, it's going to be housing, it's going to be tackling the issues around immigration, and they'll probably set up an all in citizens' assembly, and unity will be part of their portfolio, but it won't be number one. Thank you. Great answer. Um, thank you. Do you want one? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I have a question for your peace builder hat. Um, the Good Friday Agreement is not perfect. There were certainly flaws and are flaws in the peace process, but I think it really does give us a glimmer of hope of what is possible. We've had 25 years of peace now in Northern Ireland, which is a spectacular thing. Um, so my question is, we're sitting in this room as there are some really atrocious conflicts happening all around us in this world. And I think all of us can only hope someday soon those places will be in the process of reconciliation. Um, with your peace building work, what lesson would you give places um, in conflict who will hopefully start their own reconciliation process? What piece of advice would you give those places, um, given your experience as a peace builder in Northern Ireland? Thank you, Erin. Um, my answer would be that there are um, there are no winners or losers in peace processes. Nobody gets everything they want, and that's the first component of a successful negotiation, is recognizing the benefit in compromise, recognizing that um, you're not gonna get 100% of what you want. Um, I think that's a really important lesson that's lost sometimes um, in the Northern Irish context we now have a lot more 100%ers that think you can have 100% of everything. And in 1998, everybody recognized that the only way they were going to get success was through compromise. So I think that that is probably the most important point to make around finding compromise, that in peace processes you have to be willing to give up something in order to get the ultimate return, which is peace. All right, Kevin, <laughs> I'm going to ask my question now. Actually, it's not a question. I am infamous for asking for points of personal privilege, which I'm going to do now again. I'm reflecting on the last 40 years of my life, listening to this uniquely important and very personal talk that you gave for me. Um, 40 years ago, when Lou and I first went to Ireland, purportedly, for NYU, it was a, a primer on the next 50, hopefully a few more, years of my life. And to be able to sit here in my late 80s and reflect on what I have been privileged to witness, not participate necessarily, but to witness, is humbling in the highest degree. I remember being scared out of my wits by Ian Paisley. And years later, not very many, about five years later, he stood in my home and wept and said, I am a man preparing to meet my God. Martin McGinnis was standing at his side. And that was the real beginning of what the change turned out to be. And on integrated education, my only training is as an, as an educator. Education is so important to me. There was no one more important in this whole process than a phenomenal woman named Mae Blood. And they didn't know what to do with her, and they sent her to 
the House of Lords, and they didn't know what to do with her. But she moved integrated education farther than any reasonable person ever could have expected. So one person has seen the phenomenal stories, and there are so many more, in 40 more years. Please God, there's going to be another person sitting here in Ireland House saying, I remember a phenomenal woman named Emma D'Souza, and she started what everybody said couldn't be done, and she's starting it here at Ireland House. And you are all giving her a lot of material. Well done for your questions. Let's go down and have a glass. Thank you.